Under the Controlled Substances Act and Corollary State Law, the growth, trafficking, sale, possession, or consumption of psychedelics may be a felony punishable by imprisonment, fines, forfeiture of property, or some combination thereof. Psychedelical X is for general information only. Information provided on the show does not constitute legal advice, nor does your listening to the show create an attorney-client relationship with the host. Hello, I'm Gary Smith, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Psychedelic Alex, The Law of Psychedelics, my ongoing exploration of the law of psychedelics. Today's episode is a little crazy. Um, as you all know, I'm an attorney, and I, I do this show in order to try to look under all the rocks and find all the answers to the questions of psychedelics. And I live and work in Arizona, which is not exactly known as a hotbed of kind of liberal ideals or issues. And you would think Arizona would be somewhat opposed to any sort of a psychedelic anything. After all, if we can use the example of our cannabis programs, plural, two of them here in Arizona, um, both of those, our medical and our recreational program, came about by public initiative. Our, our citizenry completely by-stepped our legislature and passed our cannabis laws because our legislature refused to take up the issue. So to that extent, I wouldn't expect Arizona government ever to step into the limelight and support psychedelics. And yet, just this week, uh, under the radar, I have checked uh, online. Nobody's talking about this. I've searched Google. I've searched for YouTube videos. Uh, nothing. Nobody's talked about this. What am I talking about? I am talking about the fact that the state of Arizona just filed last week an amici brief in a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case supporting psychedelics. Let me get into the details. You may know uh, from several episodes past, I had a, a friend of mine, a fellow lawyer, Catherine Tucker, come on the show to talk about her good work in Washington State on behalf of the Right to Try movement. And you will recall from that episode, the Right to Try movement is uh, part of a legislative act, both federally and various states have a Right to Try law as well. Washington State does, as does Arizona. And under the Right to Try laws, persons who are uh, terminally ill or, or have diagnoses that can't be treated with uh, conventional medications, like anything that you know, would be on the FDA's approved list, for example, those folks have a special additional right granted by statute that they can engage uh, a right to try, it's right there in the name, isn't it, to experiment with drugs that haven't gone through the full panoply of FDA testing and approval. And there are certain terms and conditions that apply. It's got to be some sort of a terminal illness. Uh, the thing you're looking to try can't already be approved by FDA. Uh, and, and also, um, it has to be somewhere on the FDA's radar, meaning it has to at least have undergone a phase one study. And as a result of psilocybin's advances, uh, there are several psilocybin compounds right now that are at phase two and phase three's doors uh, with the FDA. As a result of that, these psilocybin compounds don't have any approval yet, but they do qualify under state and federal right to try laws. So Catherine's group has been advocating a case on behalf of uh, a plaintiff named Advanced Integrative Medical Science Institute and a whole bunch of other uh, plaintiffs have joined with them. Uh, the idea being that they had to sue the Drug Enforcement Agency to get the DEA to back off to allow them to engage psilocybin in this practice. And the idea here, of course, naturally is psilocybin isn't going to save a life. These are not medications exclusively to uh, the end of saving a human life, but rather to alleviate suffering as well. And, and that's where psilocybin enters this picture. Um, psilocybin is touted to and, and certainly has uh, a ton of support 
for the notion that it can help to alleviate anxiety and stress that comes with terminal illness and end-of-life expectation. Um, if you can imagine yourself or ever have experienced a loved one or someone you know going through this, it's horrific. So the psilocybin opportunity presents a chance to give those people a little more presence and a little more quality in their final days. So this is a really huge deal. I can't begin to even suggest how momentous this is. Uh, it's huge. Um, additionally, as I dove into this uh, new education, because I, you know, last year I'd never heard of Right to Try either, probably like none of you did. Um, but it turns out it was actually pioneered in great part right here in Arizona again. And once more, I'm shocked. Uh, the Goldwater Institute, one of the most conservative think tanks in the country, happens to be right here in my backyard of Phoenix, Arizona. And if you're not familiar with the Goldwater Institute, its namesake is Barry Goldwater, former U.S. senator, uh, who is uh, regarded as very conservative, probably made Ronald Reagan look quite liberal by comparison. Um, but the institution advocates conservative values and surprisingly comes up on issues you would never think. And in this instance, not only is the Goldwater Institute um, one of the pioneers of Right to Try, but they also filed an amici brief in this Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case, as did, shocker, State of Arizona. Our own Attorney General, Mark Burnovich, signed on to this case in support of the petition to have psilocybin used in Washington state under its right to try laws. Now, I may be taking a leap here. I hope I'm not. But this seems to suggest to me that Arizona is on the precipice of considering and accepting psilocybin under its right to try laws, because we also here in Arizona have those statutes. And, you know, it's just a tad too coincidental that our attorney general stepped into this case not having to. Uh, there's no obligation that Arizona would have submitted any amici brief in the case, but they did. Uh, so I think that's a momentous portent, and I'm, I'm absolutely tickled and thrilled, and I've searched everywhere. Nobody's talking about this. Not even the attorney general here in Arizona is talking about this. So this is news. This is huge news, and I couldn't be happier because this means Arizona is indeed on a path towards some relationship with psilocybin. And if I have any say in the matter, I'm going to be in the thick of it all. Um, so that being said, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of the case. I'm not going to do a deep dive, but let me just set the stage, and then I'll flip the screen over to um, put up some clips from the case. But again, uh, it starts in Washington State. It's actually now up at the appellate level at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And, and it's this medical group and some patients versus the DEA. And they've already gone through one level of trial type uh, rigmarole. So now they're at this appellate level and it's the Federal Circuit Court, the Ninth Circuit Court, uh, which is up in San Francisco. And the petitioner in that case is uh, obviously advancing their, their appeal. Um, and it's actually the, uh, <laughs> the government, the DEA, under uh, the U.S. Department of Justice, Merrick Garland, our, our U.S. Attorney General, is actually the appellant. Um, but the intriguing part is a number of states' attorneys general, including Arizona, submitted an amici brief. And let me explain what that is for you non-lawyers at home who uh, don't know this. So in any appeal, the typical parties are the parties who were in the lawsuit. So if, you know, Dave sued Bob uh, and they didn't like the outcome, the appeal would be, you know, Dave versus Bob still or Bob versus Dave, depending on which way the case resolved and who's taken the question up to the appeals. Um, in this instance, you would think, well, Arizona wasn't a party to that case, so why are they there? That's an amici. Amici is just a Latin word for friend. Um, the full phrase in, in legal parlance is amici curiae, meaning friend of the court. And in the right circumstances, even if you're not a party to a case, you actually can submit a request to the judge to be allowed amici status. And, and when you pursue that, you're, you're explaining the court saying, hey, judge, um, I'm not a party to the case, but what you're going to rule on here has the genuine potential to impact me in a real way. So I'd like the right to have a voice in this so that at least you can consider my position. That's amici in a nutshell. I'm super simplifying it, but that's really the basics of it. 
So in this instance, it's not at all unusual or weird for states, attorneys, generals, plural or singular, uh, to seek amici status in any of a variety of cases that are pending. So the fact that the state of Arizona chose to pursue an amici brief in and of itself, not weird, happens all the time, expected in fact. But the fact that the state of Arizona would have stepped in specifically to this case where the specific issue is states' rights under right-to-try laws to use specifically psilocybin, well, that's a lot of specifics. So you can see my excitement. Anyway, that sets the background. Uh, so now let me switch over to the state of Arizona's amici petition so you can see a little bit of what attracted Arizona's eyes on the case. Um, but obviously the original petitioner their position is they just want approval for use of psilocybin in Washington State's Right to Try program. It's as basic as that. And, and their argument is the DEA has literally no right whatsoever to be advocating against that or standing in the way of Washington State or its various physicians and medical providers and, and patients. Frankly, it's about the patients, isn't it? Um, the DEA can't stand in their way either. So... With that premise, let's turn to the case, or excuse me, the amici brief. Okay, so here's the amici brief, and I've got the caption at the top just so you can acquaint yourself with the uh, case number and the court of its filing, and you can see the case number at the top. This is at the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Again, they're based out of the San Francisco area. <laughs> And then you can see the party names, and they're not all enumerated here. The rules don't require you to list literally everybody. So the main parties' names are here, uh, and it's Advanced Integrative Medical Science Institute versus Merrick Garland. Uh, and you're thinking, well, why are they suing Merrick Garland? Well, they're not suing Merrick Garland personally. Uh, it is just that in his representative capacity as U.S. attorney, uh, a party needed to be named, and that's why Merrick's name shows up there. Um, and then as we go further down the caption, it tells you this is on review from the Drug Enforcement Agency. And then there's the literal title of this brief, which is Amicus Curiae Brief of the States of Washington, Arizona, Delaware, Illinois, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Oregon, and the District of Columbia in support of petitioners and granting the petition. Well, that's fantastic. Um, and you'll see also this is um, signed uh, and initially drafted by the attorney general from the state of Washington. So they're the, the true author, but then when you get to this bottom of the signature block, you'll see that it says additional counsel listed on the signature page. And that's where every other party who's signing on to this thing will have signed. And I'm going to jump there real quick, and then we'll bounce back up to the top just so I can show you who's signed on to this. So if we go all the way to the <laughs> literal last page, um, well, not the literal last page, there's some sort of a certification there. But the second to last page is the signature page. And here we see the Attorney General of Washington is the party signing on the original brief. And then everybody underneath this is a co-signer on this brief. They are fully in support of what this brief is advocating. And you'll see right there at the top on the left, God bless him, my own state Attorney General, Mark Burnovich. But now let's go back up to the top. So I'm going to walk you through just a little bit of the brief. There's, um, you know, 42 pages. We're not going to read it all together for sure. Um, but let's take a look at the table of contents so you can get an appreciation for what's in this thing. Um, so let's start there. And you can see there's an introduction section. Uh, there's a statement called Interest of Amiki Curie. And you'll remember a moment ago when I was doing the intro, I explained how you become an amiki. You actually have to explain that to the court in the brief, and that's what that section is about. Uh, and then section three is, well, here's what the amiki would say. And what they've got is a listing here of the right to try basics in Washington and other states. And then uh, number two here is the Federal Right to Try Act. Um, there are separate federal laws and state laws. And here's interesting. Um, the Federal Right to Try Act was actually signed into law by Donald Trump. Um, hard as it is to say nice things about him, uh, this is something he got right. So you've got a Federal Right to Try Act in addition to a State Right to Try Act. Um, then the, the list of argument goes on. Um, it describes that psilocybin treatment may be considered an investigatable, or excuse me, an investigational product under Washington law. Um, then subsection C is federal prohibition of right to try treatments authorized by state law intrudes in an area of traditional state concern. Ha ha! This is a state's rights argument in subsection C, uh, not a federalism argument. And then subsection D, 
the Federal Right to Try Act expressly precludes liability in connection with eligible treatments. The importance of that is that the right to try laws protect the people who engage in the right to try activities. Remember, you're engaging in use of substances that would otherwise be considered Schedule One and illegal. You could literally go to jail for offering it to a patient, and as the patient, you could literally go to jail for accepting it and consuming it. So that's what these statutes are aimed at, is to give uh, an exception, an exemption, a protection, so that people can engage in right to try. Um, then subsection E talks about the Controlled Substances Act and how it is not intended to regulate the practice of medicine, which is true. It's supposed to schedule drugs into categories. It's not supposed to describe how those drugs are used or by whom or when or how or where. Um, and then the uh, index lists off that the Controlled Substances Act was not meant to prohibit right to try, which is also true. Um, and then uh, subsection F, the argument is that there's no valid federal interest in regulation of state right to try treatments. Again, also true. Um, and then subsection G, which uh, is the second to last. And as you get down this list, by the way, you can tell that the uh, priority of argument diminishes. But this is still a worthwhile argument. Uh, and by the way, that's normal for appellate briefs. You always want to put the good stuff up front and then gradations of weakening as you go. But ultimately, you don't want anything weak in the brief. But here, what uh, subsection G is arguing about is that the DEA's interpretation of these statutes and rules uh, is constitutionally dubious. Uh, and of course, then H, uh, which is the argument that the harm to states is substantial if the DEA continues to stand in the way of right to try. Uh, and the issue is likely to recur, meaning that even if the plaintiff patient dies and thus no longer is around to be requesting this service, the issue would not be moot. Let me pause there for a moment because that's worth a conversation just for a second. So there's an idea in the law that if, uh, if a party's dead, well, then their issue is moot, right? They're not around anymore to benefit from a court ruling, so you don't need a court ruling. So usually when parties pass away or a case resolves prematurely, um, the case gets dismissed because there's nothing further to adjudicate. Um, and that's especially true on, in appeals. But when you have a l issue that's apt to linger, even if the party is no longer personally going to benefit or be involved, a court can still move forward and enter a ruling. This is what the uh, states are arguing in their amici brief here by saying, hey, look, this right to try question is going to linger long after this one patient is gone, so we do need an answer here. And the, the harm being substantial, I mean, without even diving into the brief, you can tell what that is. You're talking about offering someone who is in physical and mental suffering, offering them something that will relieve them from that suffering. So, yeah, withholding that treatment is substantial and harmful. So let's now take a tour of the actual meat of the text. And again, we're just going to dive in a little bit. We're not going to do a thorough read because this is a really chunky brief and these are some heady issues. All right, so we get down to uh, technically the first page of the brief. Everything to this point was like indices and, and, and tables of contents. So on the true, true page one, there's an introduction section and it introduces you to the notion that 41 states, 41 states, almost every state in the union has passed a right to try law. Almost every state has recognized, uh, as this uh, introduction discusses, that sometimes you just have to let people have their Hail Mary. It's just humane to permit that. And, you know, no, science doesn't have all the answers. And no, modern medicine doesn't have all the answers. Uh, and, and no, there's no guarantee that anything is imminently on the horizon to save anyone from anything. And as a result, as a matter of public policy, as a matter of just simple, basic compassion, having a right to try opportunity is a positive thing. And indeed, almost every state has embraced that. Now, in the next section, the interests of amici curiae, what the states are articulating here is that they, including Washington and Arizona, have an interest in avoiding undue federal regulation, particularly criminalization of the practice of medicine. And this goes on to say that the amici, again, Washington and Arizona, have an interest in upholding the rights of patients with life-threatening illnesses to make intimate medical decisions in consultation with their doctors in accordance with applicable state laws. 
So this is about states' rights. This is the main thrust of Arizona's push in this amici brief, saying, hey, federal government hands off our medical practice here in Arizona. We'll decide uh, what our citizens need medically or not. The brief then goes on for several pages discussing the right to try in Washington and other states, and it, it discusses everything I've already talked about, that unapproved drugs get uh, a fair shake and right to try. And they are Hail Marys, let's be clear. These uh, experimental drugs don't guarantee a result. They just guarantee uh, the potential for a result. Now, here in subsection B, Arizona and Washington, in their roles as amici, are discussing that psilocybin treatment may be regarded as an investigational product under Washington's right to try law. And I would argue that the same w would apply here in Arizona if this were an Arizona issue. Regardless, the important thing here is that there's an acknowledgement by Arizona that psilocybin is considered to be investigational. Um, and this, in turn, sets up a terrific argument here at home in Arizona if and or when this issue ever hits us. Now, uh, to hedge here at uh, the bottom of page 8, um, the amici petition makes a point of, so I'll just read this to you, uh, the states take no position on whether the petitioners would be eligible patients or whether psilocybin would be an eligible treatment under the Washington Right to Try program. Primarily, or excuse me, primary responsibility for making such decisions does not lie with the government. Rather, as the Washington legislature found, quote, the use of available investigational drugs is a decision that should be made by the patient with a terminal illness in consultation with the patient's health care provider, end quote. Well, that's massive. And again, nobody's expecting that any state attorney general, be it Washington or Arizona, would step in and advocate directly for the patient or directly for the psilocybin. But they are absolutely advocating that the patient should have the right to pursue this and that psilocybin should be considered a potential qualified substance, um, again, juxtaposing it against the actual requirements of the right to try statutes. The uh, brief then goes on on the next page, and this is also a paragraph worth reading. It is well established that the treatment of a life-threatening illness is not limited to curative treatments that address its etiology or cause. For example, treatment of cancer need not be limited to interventions that seek to control the division, spread, and effects of cancerous cells. Rather, such treatment often includes palliative approaches that alleviate symptoms, improve quality of life, and which, by doing so, may render curative treatments more effective. According to the World Health Organization, quote, palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients, both adults and children, and their families who are facing problems associated with life-threatening illnesses, end quote. So there you go. The right to try statutes and these amici are all in support of the notion that you don't need a life-saving drug to qualify. You just need something that's aimed at improving the terminally ill patient's quality of life for however much longer they are alive. That's the goal here. Now, starting at about page 10 and onward, is the discussion about states' rights and how the federal government, and in particular the DEA, is intruding on those rights by trying to stop these right-to-try practices from taking place. And here on page 11, the, uh, even the amici brief points out, uh, another one I'll read, by contrast, the federal government did not enter the field of national drug regulation until the 20th century with the adoption of the, poor, uh, the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906. This law was primarily concerned with adulteration, labeling, and branding. Now, these arguments go on for several pages, and then, then we get to subpart E, where the amici are discussing that the Controlled Substances Act does not prohibit therapeutic uses of Schedule I substances that are authorized under the plain language of the Right to Try Act. And this is where the amici start their argument that the Controlled Substances Act was not intended to regulate the practice of medicine. And they start the argument with one of the most significant cases that we see in the cannabis world, Gonzalez versus Rach, from 2005. And from the case, they quote, the main objectives of the Controlled Substances Act were to conquer drug abuse and to control 
the legitimate and illegitimate traffic in controlled substances. And that definition, by the way, leaves open wide avenues for people to participate in a variety of ways in substances, both scheduled and unscheduled. And then when you get to the bottom of nine, page 19, this is the start of the argument where the amici are discussing the fact that the Controlled Substances Act was never designed to prohibit treatment under the Right to Try Act, which is true. And that goes on for several pages. The brief is laden with a lot of constitutional argument, way, way more nuance than I want to get into on this review. But um, what I'm hoping to do at some future date is to see if Catherine will come back on the show and, and we can have a nice, deep, intellectual back and forth on this and really walk through and tease apart these issues. Um, but the case is still fresh. It's still pending. And I, I don't know how soon it's going to advance. Um, appeals up at the Ninth Circuit can take a very long time, um, many, many, many months, possibly years, and this amici brief was only filed um, on the 21st of May of 2021, so not even a week ago as I'm recording this episode. Um, so it's going to be many, many, many months before uh, this case advances through the Court of Appeals. But I'll keep an eye on it, and uh, I'll report back as I find more. But the cool part uh, about this is... This case has a genuine potential to either resolve at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals or it could theoretically have a shot at a U.S. Supreme Court review. Um, for those of you who aren't in the law biz, you need to know that the U.S. Supreme Court picks and chooses the cases it hears. There's no obligation that it take any petition that's filed with it, and not everybody files a petition with the Supreme Court. So that's years down the road, if ever, just laying a little premise down in case uh, you want to keep an eye on this as well. But this is cool, and the most exciting part is it means that Arizona has just identified itself as uh, maybe a little psilocybin-friendly, or shall we dare say, psy-curious? Hmm, maybe. Stay tuned. We'll see what happens. Take care. Have a question about psychedelics and the law? You're welcome to submit them. Please send your questions to admin at psychedelicalex.com. Submission of questions is not an assurance that they will be used on the show. Also, please be aware that neither the submission of a question nor a response creates an attorney-client privilege between you and the show's host, nor does an answer constitute legal advice. Information provided is for general purposes only. If you need legal counsel, you should hire competent counsel in your community. Thank you.